Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show. Welcome to the Daily Race Informed Studios here in Midtown Manhattan on Friday, July the 8th. The Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live. I'm Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. If you're watching on DRF Live, thanks for doing so. If you listen to podcast version, YouTube, SoundCloud, DRF.com, ESPN.com. Got all sorts of ways for you to find the show. Uh, very tight show. We're only going to keep it to a half hour again today. It seems like for the summer upcoming anyway, until we get a little bit of a, a more reasonable time schedule for me to be here in New York. Uh, we'll stick to these half-hour shows. Um, we're going to stick basically to Stars and Stripes Festival, <clears throat> excuse me, coming up tomorrow afternoon at Belmont Park. you got six graded stakes highlighted by the Grade 1 Belmont Derby, the Grade 1 Belmont Oaks. They seem to be the sort of premier turf races for three-year-old Phillies and Colts and Gelding. So we'll dive into those two races as well as the Suburban, which could be a big race as far as the Classic Division is concerned. You'll have FNX come back in there. You'll have a couple other ones, including Eagle and Noble Bird. And then the final race we'll talk about is the final race of the Pick 4 sequence tomorrow. That is the Belmont Sprint Championship. That includes the debut, anyway, for as far as 2016 is concerned, for Private Zone. So I guess at the very top, anyway, this is what we're going to kind of talk about a little bit, how tomorrow can kind of shape the way that a lot of these divisions look going forward throughout the rest of the year. Most notably, let's start off with the Belmont Oaks. Again, it's a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. And I think the favorite in there, and deservedly so, is going to be Catch a Glimpse, and we'll talk about the race a little bit more in depth as far as handicapping is concerned, but strictly from a, a story point of view and, and going forward, I think the unknown at this stage for Catch a Glimpse is the distance. She's 7-for-7 seven seven on turf. Nobody questions her ability or her talent level. She's a little bit of a goofball, and I, it just that's going to be something that irks me all the time no matter what. But at the end of the day, you, it doesn't bother her. She goes out and she wins. She's never lost on the turf. The question now becomes, can she successfully navigate 10 furlongs against horses that are probably better bred to do so? That doesn't mean that she can't do it, but she's going to be forwardly placed. She's going to have to deal with a horse like Auntie Joy, who she narrowly held off a few starts back in a graded stakes event. So I think a horse like Catch a Glimpse, tomorrow's a big day for her, where maybe she can stretch out to that mile and a quarter or these longer distances and try to get away from her fellow stablemate, Teppen, because later on down the road, we're trying to figure out where all these horses fit in. And as a three-year-old filly, there are a lot of races for a horse like Catch a Glimpse to continue on and take advantage of. But once we get to Breeders' Cup time of year, do you really want to have to take on the queen, the big girl, going a mile on the turf at Santa Anita and tapping in the Breeders' Cup mile? I don't think you do. I think you want to find out if she can catch a glimpse, successfully stretch out. I'm a little bit dubious, but I've been dubious about this filly for a long time, and she just continues to prove me wrong. There's no denying how good she is from a talent standpoint. We'll find out if the distance, or maybe one of these other fillies can jump up in a big way. One of them coming over from Europe for Aiden O'Brien, or maybe one of our other domestic ones can take over and take care of catch a glimpse going 10 furlongs. The final race of the day tomorrow is the 11th, the nightcap, the Belmont Sprint, and the return of Private Zone. And I think there are so many things that can happen there, because Private Zone, he feels like, Boy, isn't this a, a win for fun sort of situation or he's in deep, deep water? Because I think at this point in his career, there's no question he's a need to lead type. We haven't seen him in nearly eight months at this stage. Last time was that disaster in the Cigar Mile where he was out there and he was ranked and he didn't probably get the best ride from Martin Pedroza. But boy, at the end of the day, he just didn't re really run that well. He was supposed to come back a few weeks ago. Uh, the day before the Belmont Stakes and running the True North, there was an issue with Brian Lynch. We're not going to get into that. You are all well aware of what I'm alluding to. He's going to come in this spot right here. Seven furlongs, I think that's his game, his bread and butter, but I think he's a need-to-lead type. And with these other horses signed on in there, there's some big speed in here. And I'm not convinced that he's going to be able to get the lead, so that could be a bit of a compromising situation for a horse like Private Zone. He's going to take a lot of money. He's a name that everyone knows, and he's, he's a tested and proven sort of champion in the past. I just don't know that I want him at a short number tomorrow afternoon in the Belmont Sprint. And as far as the Suburban is concerned, really, you've got to figure out what you want to do with FNX, because FNX's most recent start down there in Stephen Foster was a disaster at Churchill Downs. There, you know, I've, I've heard multiple things about why that race was as poor as it was. If you think he can get back to one of his best races, he's a major player tomorrow. Or do you want to try and side the other direction and look for the upside, whether it is a horse like Mubtahij, who ran so well in the Dubai World Cup, second behind California Chrome. He ran very well last year here in the Triple Crown races in the Derby and the Belmont Stakes and just ran into a Triple Crown winner in American Pharaoh. It'll be interesting to see. There are a lot of ways you can go. Do you think Eagle can get over the hump? Do you think Noble Bird can get back to one of his best races in the Suburban? There are a lot of ways to go. It's a very interesting sort of sequence of races tomorrow afternoon at Belmont Park. Just got to hope 
that Mother Nature cooperates with us because it sounds like we've got some dicey weather coming in to the area over the next 36, 48 hours. So we'll see what happens. There are other graded stakes races that are also going to be happening tomorrow afternoon. We're only going to focus on the late pick four coming up momentarily, but we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll take a look at the three races we went over last weekend here, see how we fared, and then get ready for coming up to this weekend's races at Belmont Park. Stay with us on that Bernier Show. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out some profitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Twelve oh seven on the east, nine oh seven on the west. The Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live. Again, you've got so many different ways to find the show: YouTube, SoundCloud, DRF.com, ESPN.com. You want to follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. The way we normally work the show, we go over some races for this upcoming weekend. The following week, we'll go back and see how we fared, and that's the part of this story that we're going over right now. Where you look at it, we went over three races last weekend: the July Fourth weekend. The first one was a two-year-old race down at Churchill Downs. On their closing night, the Bashford Manor, we don't have a video for you, but we can kind of let you know. I thought going into it there was a potential superstar horse in the number nine recruiting ready. He went out for Horatio DePaz. Edgar Prado had the mount. This was a horse that in his debut at Laurel, I'm sorry, at Pimlico, was just so visually spectacular that it looked like this was the kind of horse that could be anything. He did it professionally. He looked good. He got out to Churchill Downs. He broke like a shot, went right to the front. He dueled a little bit with another runner in there. I believe it was Tip Tap Tap, as for Steve Asmussen. They went 21 and change for the opening quarter. They got 45 to the half. Looked like he was on his way, but he started to get a little bit short at the end. And you can understand why he's a two-year-old second time going out, first time against winners, first time outside of, of Maryland, first time shipping. And he got a little bit tired at the end, and that's not to take anything away from the Mark Cassie trainee classic empire that ran him down, because this is a horse that, in each of his two lifetime starts, he's broken poorly. It's taken him a little while to kind of get into the swing of things, but boy, when he finally does get running and get on track, very, very visually impressive. He came and ran down recruiting ready. The two of them were well, well clear. They each got giant buyer speed figures for two-year-olds at this stage in the game. I believe we're dealing with 87 and 85 figures for the first and second place finishers. Classic Empire and recruiting ready. Long, long way back to the third place runner, Tip Tap Tapazar. I think all of a sudden we're looking at it, and it's a very interesting sort of scenario where these two-year-olds already right now are as fast, if not faster, than the two-year-olds we had last year, and we saw what they've already produced. And if some people want to poke holes in them and say Nyquist exaggerator, you know, creator, that whole group, maybe they're not that good. Again, I think it's too early to tell what they ultimately could be. At this stage in the game, as three-year-olds, maybe they're not as good as what we got to see two years ago with American Pharaoh and whatnot, or I should say last year. But 
These two-year-olds right now, if they continue to develop, who knows what they could end up being. But I thought the most likely winner was the nine recruiting ready. Thought he ran a very good race, second time going out, first time shipping, first time under the lights. So many things thrown at him. He just got a little bit tired at the end. But take nothing away from the winner, Classic Empire, very, very sharp winner for Mark Cassie, Julian Leperu, John Oxley. And, and it's interesting to note as well, Cassie has another good runner that you're going to want to keep an eye on named Thirst for Life. He broke his maiden at Churchill Downs, and they've sent him out to Southern California. It sounds like he's going to be running at Del Mar over the summer. So Cassie, Mark Cassie and Norm Cassie, they've got a lot of good things going on right now, obviously with the older horses, with Teppin and whatnot, but also got some promising two-year-olds coming along. So it'll be interesting to see where these ones ultimately win, wind up. I thought the most likely winner recruiting ready. He finished second. He took a ton of money. He was to bet down to one to two. The United Nations, I thought going into it, was a very difficult race to go over. I thought there were a couple of horses that were interesting. I thought a vulnerable favorite, though, was the three Wake Forest. I thought just because, look, he's had good trips and everything just seemed to work out for him. There were some other interesting runners in there. Let's take a look as they turn for home in the United Nations. These two are all by themselves leaving. And this is not from the United behind. Nations. They're in the final furlong. Sue them all on the outside. Pull it. That's not the United Nations, as, as any of you can tell. We hear Frank Miramati telling us about it. But the United Nations, he ended up having world approval go out there. He set a perfect trip throughout. Was just stalking off of a 75-1 to 1 shot. Took advantage as they turned for home. Held off a good run from Money Multiplier. Money Multiplier was the horse that I was most interested in playing. It was one of those where I got the 5-1 to one that I was looking for. And my biggest concern with world approval, it wasn't so much the fact that I didn't think it was quality. I've loved this horse for a long, long time. I didn't think that he wanted the distance. thought he was much more of a mile and an eight sort of horse. But when you've got that good tactical speed, he just inherited the lead, held off money multiplier. Wake Forest, I suppose, if we want to call it a, a, a disappointment. He finished third. He put in his bid. He just wasn't good enough. So in a way, I think this vulnerable favorite bore out. I think it was a good good move for really all three of the top three. I don't think he can complain much. Mr. Maybe for Chad was a little bit of a disappointment. He didn't seem to put in any sort of a run. But the top three, don't think you have any complaints about the way world approval ran. And as far as the second place uh, runner is concerned, Money Multiplier, he took a shot at him, just couldn't run him down. A very good horse in World Approval that's razor sharp at this point in the game. So the winner of the United Nations World Approval, I thought a vulnerable favorite was the Three Wake Forest. He ends up running third. The Queen's Plate, let's see if we've got the right replay for this one where it's a situation where going into it, I thought it was a wide open race. You could go 15 different ways. I thought the most likely winner was the 10 Amy's Gizmo. He was coming into it, hadn't done anything wrong on the synthetic surface. Just the question ultimately came down to distance. And I thought of a live long shot was a horse that was going up for West Point Thoroughbreds and the 12 Scholar Athlete. Seemed like he'd put it all together in his most recent start on the turf at Belmont Park. Let's see. Turn for home. Queen's Plate. Athlete then Esposito, top of the lead in the Queen's Plate, and Amiz Gizmo trying to tear away. Shackamat on the inside, down the outer is Sir Dudley Diggs. Sir Dudley Diggs the threat, Amiz Gizmo in front, but here comes Sir Dudley Diggs and Julian Leparou. Sir Dudley Diggs has hit the front, and Sir Dudley Diggs from Amiz Gizmo. Sir Dudley Diggs has won the Queen's Plate. Amiz Gizmo second, all on red third, and Scholar Athlete fourth. Now, this is a, a tough thing. I'm, I'm going to be up at Woodbine next weekend with Peter Thomas Fornatel, Jonathan Kinch, and Tommy Massis. We're going to have some good times out there. I love everything about the product Woodbine puts out. I, I can't help but think that this was a weak rendition of the Queen's Plate simply because we know Sir Dudley Diggs, don't we? Sir Dudley Diggs is a horse that we've seen at Gulfstream Park, and he was, he was competitive, but he was not any sort of a superstar. Amiz Gizmo, I think the distance ultimately just got to this one, and you can tell down the lane that was just a, strictly a war of attrition. It was a matter of who was going to fold the least, and it seemed like Sir Dudley Diggs, he, oh boy, Leperu was all over him for a long, long time. Great call from, from the announcer. It was just a situation where, I, I, look, I don't know that I'm blown away by any of them. I felt like Amiz Gizmo ran his race, his 84-85 buyer. A uh, scholar athlete was getting tired at the end, a little bit leg weary. Not, not a bad effort by any stretch, running fourth, but it was just one of those that I don't think we have any superstars coming out of that race. The filly that I liked, Gamble's Ghost, she had a wide trip. She just never really got involved in the running. It was just a situation where I, I, it was a, a race that good on you if you smoked out Sir Dudley Diggs. I would have needed much more than 14 to 1 to play him, but at the end of the day, he is the Queen's Plate winner. The first time for Ken and Sarah Ramsey. Julian Leperu gets the victory. I thought the most likely winner, Amiz Gizmo, ran second. And a live long shot was the 12th scholar athlete, ended up finishing fourth. So that's how our three races last weekend fared. When we come back from break, we'll go over the late pick four at Belmont Park tomorrow. As far as the Stars and Stripes Festival is concerned, Belmont Derby, Suburban, Belmont Oaks, Belmont Sprint Championship. Stay with us. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. 
If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out unprofitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Back here with Matt Bernier show on DRF Live, 12-16 on the East, 9-16 on the West. It's time to take a look at these four races for this upcoming weekend. And we're going to be heavy as far as Naira is concerned in Belmont Park. Tomorrow afternoon, Stars and Stripes Festival, six graded stakes. We're going to go over the late pick four. Really fun, contentious races all throughout. You're going to be able to see most of these races here on DRF Live starting at 4 o'clock Eastern tomorrow with Dan Elman and Mike Beer. Uh, let's start off, first things first, just take them right in order. Race number eight, Belmont Park, is the grade one Belmont Derby, a mile and a quarter on the inner turf. Sort of the, the unknown, and again, for any of you that are new to this, the way that this works, the odds to the far right, those are not morning line odds. These are odds that I would look at as fair value for these horses. Doesn't mean I'm going to get them, doesn't mean I'm going to bet them even if I do get it, but I think this is what fair number and fair value would be on each one of these runners. So you can take a look at this as I kind of talk about the weather. The weather is the biggest concern at this stage in the game. It sounds like we have the possibility over the next two days, 30, you know, 32, 48 hours, however you want to say, 36 hours, we could have a ton of rain and serious, significant rain where it could end up making the turf course quite boggy. It could make the main track sloppy. So we'll wait and see. Fingers crossed it. it if we just maintain nothing more than a little bit of a rain and it's it's hot and humid here in the city, it's a terrible feeling outside. But as long as it stays that way, I think we'll be okay. This race in particular is going to be very interesting to see if we do get the rain. Does it turn the turf course into a complete bog and does that favor some horses over others? Um, I, I think a live long shot in this race is the horse that I'm probably going to pick whether we have off going or we stay firm. I think the 11 Aquaphobia is really interesting and it, it depends on how you want to look at this race. Mike Watchmaker, when we talked about it in the Weekend Warrior piece, he said he wasn't in love with any of the three-year-olds here. I, I can totally understand that. None of them have blown my socks off. Camelot, Kitten, Highland Sky, they're all coming out of that sort of bunched-up finish in the Pennine Ridge where he had a 101 shot and toughest hombre stick around. There's a part of me that thinks, though, if I'm going to take one of our domestic horses, give me one that is sort of the unknown in this spot. And Aquaphobia is a horse that you go two races back in that Murphy down at Pimlico on the Preakness weekend. He was just in behind horses for a little bit, stymied, stymied. When Leperu got him out into the clear, that horse finished as fast as any horse you're ever going to see. And I know the final come home time at a mile, you're going to look at it and say 23 and 3. That's not all that impressive. When you consider it was such a, it was a boggy going. It was much heavier than good, I think, in my opinion. And then you come back and you look at his Stanton. He ran very well at Delaware. He was out in the clear. They That middle move that that Joe Bravo made with him, probably about, Five sixteenths to go. It just looked kind of like a car on the far turn, driving up around everyone. Kicked on down the lane, got that final five sixteenths in about thirty and three. Again, I know that doesn't sound like it's some astronomical come home time, and he's going to need to run the best race of his life. There's no question about it. But Arno Delacour is one of the sneaky, underrated trainers I think in the United States. He does nothing but good work. Sends out good live horses, and I don't think he would put this horse in here if he didn't think he had a big chance. I think a live long shot is the 11 Aquaphobia. He's likely who I'm going to pick. If we can take a look at the odds one more time, go through the entire field. 
Just to hit on a couple other ones as far as the odds are concerned, Rollis, I understand a lot of people want to look at and say, boy, he made that big move and he's got the highest last out buyer in the field. I know Rollis. I just don't think he wants to get it done. And again, 49 to 1, that's just my opinion. I made him a 2% chance. And the idea with the value line is it has to total 100 points. Can't go over, can't go under. 100 points on the nose. Uh, Surgical Strike's a nice horse, and if he gets a little bit of yield and ground, we know he can handle it. Most recent winner of the Grade 3 Arlington Classic. Highland Sky, I like everything about him. I think he had a terrible trip most recently. With a little bit of a better ground-saving trip, he could be big. The X factor for me in this race, other than the the imports coming over for Aiden O'Brien, is Beach Patrol. Beach Patrol is a horse that I've loved for a long, long time. He was so bad. He was so bad in the Penn Mile. You've got to decide. Do you want to give him the benefit of the doubt and give him a mulligan? Because you know on his best day, he can run with any of these. So I think a live long shot is Aquaphobia in the 8th at Belmont Park. Let's move on to the Suburban Handicap. Mile and a quarter on the main track. We'll find out if it's going to be sloppy. We'll find out if it's going to be fast. I think it's a very good race. I think it's very interesting to see how things are going to shake down as far as the wagering is concerned. Uh, I look at it and say I think the most likely winner, and I'm sure some people would look at me and say I'm crazy, I think the most likely winner is the three Shaman Ghost. I think this horse for Jimmy Jerkins could be just on the sort of cusp of becoming a proper Breeders' Cup Classic contender. We did my top five last week. I put him number five as far as the Classic contenders are concerned. He's going to need to run. The race of his life, more likely than not. FNX, I'm going to draw a line through the Foster. I know he's a better horse than that. You can see the entire preview that Dan Illman and I did for this on video.drf.com. Uh, kind of the unknown is Mubtahij. How's he going to handle coming over here? He's been with Kieran for a while. First time Lasix. Past four years, first time Lasix. First after the trainer switch for Kieran McLaughlin. 5 for 11 with the 359 ROI. Mubtahij, I think he's well meant. I think it's a scenario, though, I won't be surprised if we don't get his best race until we get up to Saratoga and the Whitney. Let's take a look. My most likely winner of the Grade 2 Suburban is the number 3, Shaman Ghost. Let's move on to race number 10. Belmont Oaks Invitational Grade 1s for the Phillies, mile and quarter on the inner turf. All the same things that I spoke about with the Belmont Derby can be echoed about the Belmont Oaks. You've got a full field in here. I think it's you can go a number of ways. And the horse to beat, no question about it, is the Philly we talked about at the top of the show for Norman Mark Cassie. Look, catch a glimpse in, in so many ways. Is the horse to beat. She hasn't done anything wrong. I'm very concerned about the distance, particularly with the way that she flips her leads down the lane. She's a goofball. She's got a mind of her own. But, boy, she's a running fool. I think she's a very talented filly. I think she'll ultimately want a mile, and anything past that is going to be stretching it a little bit. I look at this race and say I think the most likely winner is the four, Time and Motion, and I'm pretty bullish about Time and Motion. I think she was spectacular in that most recent start in the Wonder Again. It was a situation where Johnny V had her covered up, waited, got her out into the clear. I thought the minute she finally turned, changed leads, she had a huge, huge turn of foot. She galloped out very strong. I think this filly is going to relish this mile and a quarter going, where some of these other ones may not. They may prefer a mile to a mile and an eighth. I think there are no problems with her. She's 6-1 to one in the morning line. I made her 5-1. to one. Anything in that ballpark, I'm going to send it in on her. And she's going to be a key for me with my pick four sequence. Uh, I think catch a glimpse. I'm going to call her a vulnerable favorite, even though I'm, I'm going to acknowledge she's so far the, the most likely winner. The only question ultimately becomes... Can she stay the distance? I have a live long shot. We don't have it listed right here as well, but I'll let you know about it. I, I think the 10 land oversee. This name is familiar for anyone that's been paying attention to the three-year-old Phillies. She was a good second in the Kentucky Oak. She was a bit of a troubled trip in the, in the uh, Black Eyed Susan down in Pimlico. She went off as the 7-5 to five favorite. It's a situation where she's been gone since then. But I think a lot of people forget the fact that this filly broke her maiden on turf and did so very, very impressively down at Del Mar last year. I know she was beating maidens, and she got a slow fig for it, but she did it the right way. And Doug O'Neill's no dummy. I think it'd be interesting to see what she can do here. I think she can handle the turf. I think it's a big, big number. I made her about 13-1. to 1. She's 20-1 to 1 on the morning line. I think she's a live long shot. But my most likely winner is the four-time emotion. And I think Catch a Glimpse has a huge chance, but I think she's a bit of a vulnerable favorite in the Oaks. Let's move on to the nightcap, final leg of the late pick four, final leg of the pick six, final leg of everything, because this is after this race, we go home. The 11th race, the grade three Belmont Sprint Championship, I think a vulnerable favorite in a major way is the two private zone. I acknowledge he is probably, if you just look at it on paper, the fastest horse in the race, but I don't know where he is as far as form is concerned. He was supposed to make a start a few weeks ago, didn't do so for you know the reasons. Um, I I think a live long shot in here, though, and and it's going to be fascinating to see how they bet this race. Because I think private zone is going to take a ton of money. After that, probably marking. I think marking is going to be kind of the, the wise guy money on the outside for Kieran and Godolphin. Joking is just in razor-sharp form for Charlie Baker. 
razor sharp form, rattled off three consecutive victories, a neck away from four consecutive and being undefeated here in 2016. The other things that he has going for him, if it comes up wet, three for four lifetime in a wet track, four for four in the exacta. Highest last out buyer with a 103 against greatest stakes competition. You can make the case that those horses, holy boss and dad's caps, they're not that far off from these horses. I think there are just so many things to like about this horse. Charlie Baker, past year, dirt sprint winner last out in New York, five for 14 with a 750 ROI. Joking is 10 to one on the morning line. I don't know what kind of price I'm gonna get on him because I think this race is gonna be fascinating from a wagering standpoint. I think a live long shot is a six joking. I'm picking him in here. I'm going to have a lot of money in him as far as the pick fours and pick threes are concerned. And I want to be alive to him in the double in a big way. So there you have it. I think a vulnerable favorite is the two private zone. I think a live long shot is the six joking. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to wrap the show up for this week. We'll give you an update of what's to come for the upcoming weekend here on DRF Live. And we'll get you ready for the entire weekend of racing with the Friday uh, Formulator Race of the Day. Stay with us on the Matt Bernier Show. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out some profitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Twelve twenty six on the east, nine twenty six on the west. The Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. If you want to talk about any of the races and whatnot, uh, let's take a look at the upcoming slate on DRF Live this weekend, starting at four o'clock Eastern. That'd be tomorrow afternoon. You'll have Dan Ilman, you'll have Mike Beer here in studio. They're going to bring you through all these big races. But do you want to talk about smorgasbord, graded stakes action all across the country, going from parks to Delaware to Belmont Park up here in New York, all over the place, wrapping up with a non-graded stakes race. But it's all stakes racing tomorrow afternoon on DRF Live. The Parks Dash is going to be a sneaky race as well. I believe Ben's Cat is going to be coming back, so be an interesting spot as well. Delaware Park, Illman and I have got a pick four that we'll be doing this afternoon. That, that'll be up here shortly on video.drf.com. You'll be able to see what we think about that sequence. You won't see me tomorrow. I'll be out at Belmont Park, NBC, 430. Starting, we'll go through, we'll bring you through the Belmont Derby, the Suburban, and the Belmont Oaks. So we'll see how things go there. Normally, we do a video of the week in this sort of slate, in this wrapping up period. But the week got away. There was all sorts of stuff. I didn't get back into the city until late, late on Wednesday night. It just it was one of those things that, you know, the, the 4th of July weekend, I had another thing going on with family. So just a little bit helter-skelter here this week. So as far as the video of the week, we don't really have one. Maybe next week we'll be able to get something before I have to take off and head up to Woodbine. As far as your racing day is concerned, it's really just getting started. It's only 1230 we got a Twilight card at Belmont Park, and Illman and Beer, they came in here earlier in the week, and they gave you the Formula 8 race of the day for Friday. It's the Saginaw Stakes at Belmont Park. Best of luck this weekend. Again, DRF Live starting at 4 o'clock Eastern tomorrow, Illman and Beer, 4.30 on NBC. We're going to have the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series. And then going forward, we'll check up with you next week. We'll get ready to see how we did with these four races, and then we'll bring you forward going into a weekend of racing up at Woodbine for myself and Peter Thomas Fornatel and Jonathan Kinchin. Best of luck this weekend. We'll see you on Friday.